Welcome to Sheepless Needles, vegan podcast, not about being vegan, where we talk about all sorts of fun stuff. We talk about knitting. We talk about cats. I've got one in my lap, Maggie. Uh, we talk about bunnies. We talk about uh, games. It could be video games. It could be role-playing games. It could be board games, books. I don't know, just life stuff. That's what we do here. So grab a chair or sit in it. I don't know, sit in a chair, pull it up, grab a project and hang out. This is going to be a little piecemeal because I'm taking a break from work right now. I'm going to film a little bit and then go back to work and, and kind of do that until we're done. Um, hi, Maggie. Are you trying to say hi to the people? So if you're new here, welcome. This is a train wreck of a podcast. I will inevitably forget what I'm talking about and repeat things or just completely go off on tangents that make no sense. So, you know, if that helps you with your knitting, your crocheting, your crafting, this is the right place for you. Um, welcome. And if you're returning, thanks for coming back for this chaos of I don't even know what anymore. I have my coffee. It's very good. I'm very happy that I have my coffee this morning. Um, the first thing I want to kind of touch on today, and I'm going to try to make this a pretty concise podcast, but we know I fail miserably at that every time I try to do it. But I want to talk about the importance of swatching for your project. And I know we hear that from everyone, you know, especially with sweaters, right? Or a fitted garment. You got to swatch, you got to swatch. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb and say most of us do not find that process enjoyable. We just want to do the project, right? Now, there are some people who like the ritual of swatching and they'll do these really cool books. And I, you know, that's just not me. So <clears throat> in some ways I wish it was because I would have a lot less failure. <laughs> that's debatable. <laughs> Anyway, I want to talk about why, as a vegan, I find swatching important. And maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't, and leave it in the comments. There's a couple things that go on as a vegan when you knit. And one of them is we're constantly using patterns that the majority of people are writing with a specific yarn that they're using, which is typically going to be wool or an animal fiber, right? <clears throat> So, I mean, we all know that animal fiber is going to behave differently than plant fiber. Um, you know, wool, whether it's superwash or not, we know is either going to grow or not grow. It could felt all different things that create a different fabric. And that fabric is probably intended by the design writer. And it's, you know, there are comparable yarns in the plant fiber world to the animal fiber world where we can get a pretty good match, right? There are some that like mohair is a little rough, but somebody, oh, somebody in one of the groups I'm in had mentioned a yarn that they got from Hobby um, or Hobie. I'm not sure how you say that. Um, that kind of mimicked mohair. And I'm very curious about that. And I want to say it was called a light, but I might be wrong on that. So if you know what I'm talking about, please share it in the comments. And maybe what we could do down the road is do a podcast about, hey, are you knitting a garment that needs to have, I don't even, I just lost my train of thought, needs to have, you know, felting or needs, you know, this mohair fuzziness or, you know, you need roving, whatever it is. And here's, here's what they are suggesting what is our plant fiber replacement for that? How can we make that better? Because you know, plant fiber is better than animal fibers. Don't care what anyone says. Better for several reasons. Okay, so anyway, back to the whole topic. The swatching. So because the, the fibers behave differently, it, it is really important to know how your, your fiber is going to create a fabric, right? And the first step of that is obviously doing the swatch. And you'll hear this too, and I agree, more often than not, we make our swatches too small. Make sure you're making your swatch big enough where you can do the, the gauge measurement a good distance from the borders. So none of these like one by one swatches, come on, let's, let's raise our game. You know what, at the end of the day, you could make a dishcloth. 
use that as the gauge swatch and then gift the, the dish cloth. Hey, two potatoes, one peeler. I don't know. Um, so anyway, it's make, do your swatch. I am very guilty of not swatching for a lot of projects because some of my projects or the majority of my projects are not shaped projects. They're not sweaters. They're not garments. It'll be a shawl. It'll be a scarf. It'll be a hat. It'll be a dishcloth. You know, it's not something that, you know, I'm uber concerned that I'm going to hit gauge. But in the projects where I am concerned about hitting gauge, yeah, you need to do the swatch. So we have a, we being the vegan knitter and crocheting group on Ravelry, we are doing a February make along and I am doing Andrea Mowry's Comfort Fade Cardigan, which I'm super stoked about. And I knew I needed to swatch for it. So I went ahead and, and I swatched. And it was really interesting to me. The yarn that I had purchased for it was Baraco, and it was their Comfort DK. And it is a mixed fiber, and I want to say it's cotton and nylon, maybe. It's really, it's very stretchy. It's kind of like a sock yarn almost, but it's DK weight. And so I did my swatch, and the recommended needle was a US 6, and it was... 21 stitches per four inches. And I forget what the row count was, but I was more concerned with the stitch count. So when I did my swatch with the US six, I ended up at 24 stitches. So definitely way more than I needed and it wasn't gonna work. So then I went to a US seven and I think I ended up at 20, maybe 22, 23 stitches. Then I went to a US eight, you get the picture. I just couldn't get gauge. And by the time I did the US 8, that fabric was so drapey. It'd be beautiful for like a nice spring shawl or like, oh, like a tee or like a, I don't know, an overlay of some sort. It would be beautiful. And that is what I will use it for. Um, spoiler, I'm not using that yarn. <laughs> but, you know, so I posted in Ravelry about it and the, the people on that group are so helpful. So never be shy about asking questions because I ask a ton of questions that I'm sure are really moronic, but everybody is so helpful and so nice. And someone kindly pointed out, hey, uh, did you wash and block your swatch? What do you guys think? No, of course I didn't. Of course I hadn't. So I did. And boy, am I glad that I did because the stitch count changed drastically. The US six went from 24 stitches to 22 and so on and so forth. So you can kind of get the picture. And oops, I do have the swatch here, which I will show you. So this is washed and blocked. On the bottom is the US 6, the middle is the US 7, the top is the US 8. Now, I like the fabric on the 6, right? But it's still a little thin for my liking for this cardigan. So I opted to use a secondary group of yarn that I purchased, which is Cloudborn Fibers. They're 100% Pima Cotton um, DK weight. And that, I did gauge and I washed and blocked it. I did get gauge on that. So on the bottom is the US 6. And by the way, if you look whoop, right there, I fell asleep and I put this down with the needle in it overnight and it completely morphed the stitch. Don't leave your needles long-term in work. That's what I have to say about that. Um, and then the top is the US is US 5. I got perfect gauge with a US 5. It's a size smaller. I'm good with that. I love the fabric. I already cast it on. I don't have it down here. I'll show it to you later. Um, but a couple things here. Fibers behave differently once they're laundered really important to remember that. And I tried to skip a step and I'm really glad I didn't. So because I'm using 100% cotton, what I found interesting about that is that swatch when I washed it did not change at all, but that Baraco being a mixed fiber did. And I think that is where we get into this territory of like, you need to make sure that whatever we're, if we are replacing an animal fiber, which obviously you're a vegan knitter or crocheter, you are, just double check that you're getting the end product you want and, and take the step of washing and blocking your swatch. You know, 
I'm sure you guys are all doing that and you're like, Shannon, you're a friggin' moron for not doing that to begin with. But again, I am me and that's probably an accurate description of me and there you have it. So that is, that is, I think, one of the reasons why you want to swatch. The other one is a little bit more of a personal issue that I have. I don't like it when the non-vegan crafting community blames something on the fiber being vegan, like i.e. you knit something that's too small. Oh, it's because you used the wrong yarn. You, you need to be using wool. You can't be using cotton for that. Or you knit something and I, whatever it is, whatever the case is, if something goes wrong or they don't like it, it is immediately not the skill of the knitter. It is the fiber that you used is wrong. And I just, you guys, it's not true. And I don't want to feed into that, but I also just kind of want to be like, e -e -e. here you go. Here's my swatch. It works. And look, I did this in, in plant fiber and it not only does it meet my expectation, but there's no way you're going to turn around and say, oh, that didn't work out because it was cotton or it was rayon or it was bamboo or whatever the fight insert plant fiber. I just don't want to give them that leg. I don't want to give people that out of blaming a vegan fiber for something that is really more the responsibility of the knitter or the crocheter or the crafter. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just don't want to give fuel to the fire. I, I'm, I'm not playing that game. And I have noticed, and I'm sure if you're watching, other people have noticed, there can be some pretty heavy animosity about plant-based fibers um, and the question of why you use them. And, you know, I don't have a good response. I respond differently every time because I guess it depends how I'm approached. You know, sometimes you're approached and it's a very innocent question where you, you can tell they honestly want to understand why you're making that choice. And that type of person who asks that type of question, I am more than happy to talk to them about it. But you all know when you get the person who's just asking to be an ass, right? To be argumentative, just to be a jerk. That's the kind of stuff I don't have time for. And I just, I'm not, if I can head that off, I will. And I, I think we have all had those experiences and not only with our crafting, but certainly with when you go out to eat with people, you know, the people who really genuinely want to know why you made the choice you made versus the people who are just assholes. End of story. So do your swatches, do your swatches. I'm going to write a song about swatches. All right. So that's my break for the morning. I will be back later. Toodles. I'm back for a secondary break. My neck is hurting. Oh man, I'm sore. I've been doing um, two different workout challenges at the same time. So I think I kind of bit off more than I can chew. <laughs> so it hurts to go up and down the stairs because my glutes are on fire and it really hurts to lift my right arm. <laughs> Ouch. So I, you guys, get ready for it. I finished something. I actually finished a project and I finished it within the month of January. So I was very, very I'm very proud of myself and I'm actually wearing it. This is the Spiraling Cables Triangle Shawl by Stephen West. This was part of his Hyper Knitting 2 book. Um, I didn't do the make along with the, that, that group or anything, but I just loved the pattern. The pattern is very, very similar to the Botanic Shawl. If um, you remember that, I knitted that for my mother-in-law and I love that pattern. It's a very easy pattern to remember so you can kind of just knit on it and go. And this has the same basis to it, but instead of slipping stitches, you're actually cabling. And in this project, I learned, you guys, I learned how to cable without a cable needle. And I was so nervous when I first started because I was like, I'm gonna lose these stitches. I'm not gonna know where they are and I'm gonna have to start all over. But guess what? You don't lose the stitches. It's super, super easy. So. Anyway, I learned how to cable without a cable needle, and I'm going to remove a cap from my lap and see if I can kind of actually show this to you. Um, hi. 
Hello. Do do do. Okay. Let me see if let's see what I can do here. Oh. I'm really sore. Ow. Okay. This is this is going to be very hard to do, but this is the beginning. Okay, so you start, you cast on up here, and we'll just kind of, whoa. And then you end here, right? Now, it's got a really cool border that I had not done before. And I'm going to try not to blow out the, the lighting on this, but it is a folded over border. So it's essentially you're knitting, you're knitting, you're knitting, you do a cup, you do some yarn overs, and then you knit, you knit, you knit. Um, and then you fold it over and hem it on itself. So it makes this little like scallop, right? If you can see that. So the project... Oh man, that lighting. <sighs> okay, maybe I'll throw in footage of this that isn't so bajankity because of the lighting down here and I don't have time to mess with it because I'm just taking a break from work. Um, okay, so the pattern called for um, using US 7s with DK weight. And when I, I actually swatched, <laughs> When I did the swatch, I didn't like the fabric for it. Um, I wanted this to be a little bit thicker and a little bit cushier because I really, really wanted it to be warm, which is the result that I got, but at the cost of about 12 ro rows of knitting. The base of the pattern here would have gone on for probably, I don't know if I can show you this, this diamond would have been completed. So it was another maybe six rows, not 12, I don't know. Anyway, um, because I ran, I was gonna run out of the main color, which is this mulberry color, and I really, really did not wanna run out of yarn and try to, you know, kind of, I don't know, put something else in it. So I opted to end early, and it, the shawl is, is a little smaller than I would like it to be, but that was because of my choice on the needle. If I were going to knit it again, I probably would use the US 7 so that I could wrap it around my neck a little bit easier, but I love it, you guys. It is so toasty warm, and what I think is really funny is it matches my hair, and that was completely unintentional. I wish I could say I had planned that, but I had not. Um, it won't match it for long because this, this shit will fade real quick, <laughs> but I have a finished object. Cheers to me. And so now that I finished it, I think I cast it on on like New Year's Day or New Year's weekend. And I finished it about a week ago, I think, a week and a half ago. Um, so it's a quick knit. It's not in it. It's not, it wasn't anything so hard that you couldn't watch TV or do other things. So it was a really, really good knit. But it left me with the end of January where I was like, well, what am I going to do with my time? Because, you know, I need to cast the sweater on in February. So I don't want to start anything crazy. And I just had this sneaking suspicion that there was something I was supposed to be working on. And sure enough, you guys, there was. And, and some of you will know what this is immediately when I say it. Other of you, other of you, oh my gosh, other of you will um, understand once I show it to you. But the turkey tail attacked. And... For those who know, you know, it's a Stephen West pattern. It was the Shawlography 2021 make along. So it was a knit along, I think that started in October. Yeah. And I'm still not done. Everybody else is probably way done, but not this girl here, not this slow knitter, not a happening. So um, it is a great, it was a... <laughs> 
It is a pattern that I probably will not knit again, but it is a pattern that I learned a phenomenal amount of different techniques, um, some of which I still need to uh, practice greatly. Others I'm feeling fairly confident about. It is called the turkey tail. Well, here, you know, I'll just show you. You'll know why it's called the turkey tail. You will know why this is called the turkey tail. Okay, G get ready for it because it's a tail. You guys, it's a turkey tail. Okay, so a needle just went flying. That's okay. Where I am at on this, it uh, I do really, I do really like it, you guys. Um, so, in Stephen West fashion, if I can figure out where I'm at on this thing, um, I'm just gonna say that Stephen West has the longest bind offs known to mankind. I challenge you to find me another one that has bind offs quite as lengthy as his. So this bind off starts here and it's these stripes, okay? So you're just continually striping and it's kind of like an I cord bind off as you're striping. So I thought you know, I'm going to pick this back up. I'm going to wipe this out. It'll be done. So I was like, I have to be halfway through this border. I can't, I counted my stripes. I have 25 stripes. I have 29 more to go. This turkey tail will be attacking well into 2022. This turkey tail might still be attacking 2023. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Now, I will say doing the stripes is pretty brainless. You can memorize the pattern and go about your business. But, you know, it's just this is the gift that keeps giving. Do you have a project like that? Do you have a project like a turkey tail attacking you where it's just not going away? And you have to, you can't not finish it, right? Like, I, it's kind of like a bad book. If I pick up a bad book, I really have to finish it. Like, I have a really hard time going, this is a bad book. I'm not going to read it. For some reason in my head, I'm like, oh, it could get better. They never get fucking better. Oh, sorry. They never get better. This turkey tail attacking trauma will just keep on going on. Keep on keeping on. You know what I'm saying? So... I've got that that I'm working on until the cast on. So I'm going to put, I'm, it's just there. It's just there. Okay. I'm going to get back to work. I'm back. Okay. So I took some, I can never get my chair. I, I am never situated. Okay. I'm always moving around. So I apologize for that. Come on, Maggie. Then we got Maggie who needs to get in on it. Come on. I don't have all day, sister. <laughs> Here we go. Um, okay, so I have cast on Andrea Mowry's Comfort Fade Cardi. I will have Steve put a photo up here of the yarn that I am using for said project. Um, as I said before, it is Cloudborn Fibers, 100% uh, cotton, Pima Cotton, DK Weight. I love it. I've just started it. I will let you know how it goes. But I feel like I also need something kind of simple to knit on when I want to break from the sweater, right? And in true, somebody's eating my lunch <laughs> and it's not me. <laughs> in true Sheepless Needles fashion, when I have a plethora of choices, I allow the universe through its dice 
decide my fate. So, can you read it? I have a list here of six different projects. One is my Let's Boogie Halloween sweater. Two is a hat to be determined. I've got a couple different simple hats I'd like to knit, so if I roll a two, we'll figure out what that'll be. Number three is my painting honeycomb sweater, um, which I, I really am just done with the yoke. I haven't even separated for sleeves. So there's like a ton of just like stockinette stitch, which would be perfect. Um, four would be the painting honeycombs blanket. Five would be a cowl of my choice. And there's a couple different ones. In fact, there's a cowl that matches uh, well, it doesn't matter. We'll just see what I roll. And then six would be Attack of the Turkey Tail. Okay, so dice set. Now, you're just going to trust me because I am, I don't, I'm not, I can't hold the camera and roll and do all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm talented. I'm not that talented. All right, we're going to get the, we're going to get the decent. No, we're not. We're going to get the D6 out. <laughs> the D6, look how pretty it is. This is my sea glass dice set that I got on the Kickstarter, and I, you guys, love it. All right, I'm going to roll it on my mouse pad over here. And whatever I roll is what I will be knitting along with. I feel like I'm talking in front of a fan, like, you know, when your voice gets that weird thing. Anyway, um, whatever I roll is going to be what I knit alongside my Comfort Fade Cardi. And I rolled, can you, I rolled a five. And now I don't even remember what that was. I know it's not the turkey tail, though. <laughs> <laughs> universe yes oh it's a cowl okay so I will be doing a cowl pattern to be determined now I do know in Ravelry I think I saved like a gazillion cowls so I'll just take a look through them and I have plenty of stash for yarn so no purchases will be necessary for said cowl okay now Although I have that stash, I seem to be creating stashes on a daily basis with my shopping habit. So I just want to quickly show you some things that came in the mail that I do have plans for that I'm not going to share yet. It's not that big of a deal, partially because I'm really not quite 100% sure and I don't have everything that I need yet. But okay, so let's, let's do a little show and tell. <clears throat> okay, now. On my spiraling cables triangle shawl, I'm never gonna get that name right. Um, I used Terrapin Fiberworks yarn. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier or not, but that is the, it's a indie dyer. Um, I'm not sure where she's based out of, but her shop, is, I, it was on Etsy is where I found it. So she is also doing a garden club die series and the first two for January came out and I did purchase them in early January and they just came and here they are so this is sage this is garlic and I don't know if you're going to be able to pick this it, like oh, I guess you can dudes it does look like garlic it's crazy fingering weight 100% cotton um <clears throat> I could not be happier. I don't know. Like you can kind of see the variation when it's beautiful, 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 beautiful. So hats off to Terrapin Fiberworks because this is awesome. And what came with it, uber cute. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Come on, bub. Stitch markers. And they're garlic bulbs, you guys. Look at that. And then a sage leaf. Isn't that cute? Very, very cute. Um, and she also sent seeds. Those of you who know me know I don't have a green thumb. So, you know, let's just fingers crossed that I don't. 
kill that. So that was my Terrapin Fiberworks. Maggie, you're going to need to chill out because I can see that you want to get in my... There she goes. Okay, so then the next thing I got is a yarn club, the very first yarn club I've ever joined. I will leave links in the show notes for everything I'm talking about. Um, it's BZY Peach or Busy Peach. I'm not sure which. Um, I found this on in through Instagram because someone was like, hey, shout out your favorite vegan uh, yarn people. And this one came up and I had never heard of her. And here it is. So this is her yarn club. I joined it for the year. Um, this colorway are the, the 2022, I guess, colors of the year. Um, and this base is incredible, you guys. It's 52% cotton, 48% rayon. That is not a mix I have ever knit with. I'm super stoked about this. So this came in, I don't have it. Oh shoot, I don't have it down with me. I was so excited. It came with a project book where you can put like projects in and like fill things in. Super cute little book, came with it. Highly recommend, very, very happy. We'll leave in show notes. Um, okay, and then, <laughs> This is a do this one's a doozy, so I'm gonna just try to do my best on this. Now, I don't really have patterns to show you, but I actually ordered yarn kits, which I have never done before. I ordered a kit for a particular shawl and I ordered a kit for a particular tee. There was a tad bit of a mix-up when the order came where my I got someone else's patterns and they got my patterns, but I got the right yarn. So I emailed um, the owner of the, you know, of the company and within and I'm not kidding within 15 minutes I had the patterns so on it 100% customer service I give it an A plus it is yarns to go is the company name and then the designer is Petra Breakstone found her through Ravelry and sorry Maggie is completely distracting me here now I am going to try my best to hold all of these I think I'm gonna have to do this in sections so this is for the shawl. You guys, dudes, hi, hello. -ho. No, you can't have my soup. I know that's what you're trying to get to. I know you want to eat my soup, but you cannot have it. N-O spells no, kitty. Okay, second grouping. So as you can tell, this will be a very Shannon-esque shawl. It's kind of like Joseph, um, you know, Technicolor, dream coat, chicha, but it's a shawl. Okay, so that was the kit for the shawl. And once I start on this, I'll, you know, I'll probably vlog about it a little bit more. I didn't really want to add this while I was doing the Comfort Fade Cardi because I feel like they might be a little more complicated than I want to deal with while doing that sweater. But the tea kit that I ordered is it's just a simple charcoal um, this is linen it's fingering weight I forgot to tell you the other one is the softness base cat you will not be eating my soup um, it is light worsted weight 50% draylon and 50% cotton I don't know what draylon is but I should probably look that up and make sure it's not like killing rainforests I don't know I'll look that up but that's that um, and then I did order a single skein of yarn through Petra that I just really liked the colorway you guys come on for some reason this just straight up reminds me of 16 candles I can't tell you why I don't know why I'm having that reaction I just am okay so what, what did we just learn? We learned that I need to reel in my shopping and that's okay. I turned 51. I was having a little bit of a second midlife crisis and I'm apparently having a third one because I will digress very quickly on this because I do want to put this out there. I, yeah, I'm obviously having a weird issue with, with being 51. I don't know what's going on, but I'm feeling like a fish out of water. And I was trying to talk about this. We had a knit night, just uh, or the cast on party. And I butchered what I was trying to say. It just wasn't coming out right. So this, if you were on that, this is what I was trying to say. 
For the majority of my life, I have always felt a little bit other than and kind of like outside of the cool group, so to speak. Like, I don't think I've really ever fit into one particular social group. And I wasn't one of those people who fit in all the groups either, right? So it's, it's always something that's been in the background. And when I was really little, I was super shy. And I don't know, something happened where I made a distinct choice to be very extroverted. So I was kind of like an extroverted introvert, if that makes any sense. But it really affects me in weird ways. And I think I, I'm, I'm not alone. I know there are so many people who feel the way that I do. I just want to talk about it so that if you feel this way, you don't feel like you're like an island unto yourself. So basically, like when I was in high school, um, I started concentrating on writing and I really thought I was going to be a writer. And I had a really great professor in New Hampshire who I wish I had known at the time who he was and the gravity of his talent. But youth, that was lost on my youth. And that's okay. Can't do anything about it now. And he passed away. So really, really can't do anything about it now. Um, but he had told me that he always felt like I was in the wrong time. Like I was ahead of my time. But I don't think that's what he really meant. And that's not really the way I took it. I don't look at myself as a, a groundbreaking person who is ahead of the ball game. Um, I just don't. Um, I like what I like. And I think a lot of times I like underground things or subversive things that then become mainstreamed. So it, to someone who doesn't know me or is looking from the outside, I guess I could see the correlation of being ahead of time. But really, in reality, I'm in the wrong time. Like, I, I always feel like I might be in the right place, but I'm in totally the wrong time. Or I'm at totally the wrong time in the right place. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I just can't seem to get the equation to work out. And it, is a, it makes me feel like a fish out of water. I don't know how to not feel that way. And as I've gotten older, it does chip away a little bit at my self-confidence. And I never used to have that issue. I was always a very confident person. And now I'm not nearly as confident. And I question my skill level. I question why I'm doing things. And I force myself to take risks where when I was young, I just took them and didn't think twice. And now I consciously have to say, no, you got you to gotta try it. Like, I have to talk myself into doing things. I'll do them. It doesn't stop me from doing things. And maybe that's, maybe that's it. Maybe the conversation that I'm trying to have with myself and with all of you is sometimes we have to talk ourselves into doing things that we know we need to do. <laughs> and other times it's nice to have reassurance that you're not a complete loony bird, right? And I know I'm a little loony, like, you know, the big joke for many, many years when we ran the rabbit rescue was like, rabbit people are nuts. Like we would go out for adoption events or like picnics and, or rescues, like whatever it was, whatever function, we would come back home and it always would be like, that woman was so nutty, not me, like whoever we will, were dealing with, like what a nut job. And after about five years, you realize, wow, like, most bunny people are really nutty. And then it dawned on me, you know how when you blame, like, I okay, it, it's not the other people that are nutty. It's me. <laughs> it just makes me laugh that for so long I thought it was totally normal and it was all these other people. No, it was me all <laughs> It was me all along. But that is, I think that's what I'm talking about, is that fish out of water syndrome has really been weighing heavily on me lately. And I don't know, to be frank, if it's because I'm putting myself out there on the internet and maybe I'm a little self-conscious of that to some degree. I Do I care what other people think about me? Well, in the same way that you would. Yeah, of course. You don't want people throwing stuff at you and hating you. But at the same time, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to allow someone's opinion of me to alter the way that I do things. It doesn't mean I won't listen if it's constructive, but obviously there's a lot of gross stuff that happens on the internet that is not constructive. So that kind of stuff I can filter out. But yeah, I don't know. I, 
I'm having a weird confidence issue. And so I'm hoping that maybe that if I can complete a knitted project and be proud of it, that maybe that will help my confidence. I don't know. Knitting also helps me work through that stuff in my head. It's kind of like that litter box moment where I've talked about this before. When I do the litter boxes in the morning, I'll have a litter box thought. And this has been just popping up in my head almost every day for the past like two weeks about just like, wow, I'm feeling really out of sorts. I'm feeling a little bit off. And I don't know, maybe it's the stars aligning, maybe it's my birthday, maybe it's whatever it is. If you are having a similar incident in your life, you're not alone. Um, and if you think everybody around you is crazy, <laughs> it could be that they are, but more than likely it might be you. <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone. Okay, so that's that. <clears throat> um, the only other thing I have to touch on today, because I haven't touched on enough, right? Gaming. We're going to have a little talk about following rules. Now, this is not about a video game. This could be about any type of game, though. It could be a video game. It could be a tabletop game. It could be a role-playing game. It could be a card game. It doesn't matter. You pick your game, and this, this conversation will fit it. Okay, so... All games have rules, right? There's very rarely a game that you don't have to follow a rule set for. So what do you do when you realize you're playing a game that is an ongoing game? It's not just like a two minute and you're done and you're walking away, right? You're playing an ongoing game and you realize that you had part of the rule set wrong. And it may have been in your favor. It may not have been in your favor. It may have been a mixture of the two. Do you start over, walk yourself backwards, start over, or do you say, okay, from this point forward, now I know, and I'm going to play correctly or follow the rules. And this is like knitting, and you're going to see why in a se well, I'll just tell you why I think this is like knitting. To frog or not to frog. When you make a mistake, and it is... 20 rows below or above, however you're holding your knitting. Do you let it go and keep going? Or are you somebody who can't deal with that mistake and you frog backwards? And I did watch a video with Stephen West, shocking that I'd be doing that. And he was saying that if 10% is a really good ratio, Error, your error ratio, if it goes over 10%, you probably need to frog. Under 10%, design elements and move on. And I think I definitely fall into that category. Now, let's bring this back on track. The game. The game that I am talking about is Gloomhaven. My husband and I, it's a campaign game that can last for multiple years. No kidding. We've been playing it for, I think, almost two years and probably about, that's my work phone, but I'm on break, so we're just going to let it ring. That's annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, we found out probably about 30 days ago, give or take, that we had been incorrectly healing our characters that were playing meaning that we were giving ourselves health points that we should not have been getting. So in many of the scenarios in this campaign that we had played through, one of us potentially could have died, which would have changed the trajectory of the campaign, right? At the same time, that, okay, Steve realizes this after being on Reddit. At the same time, I separately realize, oh my gosh, we were supposed to be like raising the prosperity level of Gloomhaven to give us lower you know, prices at merchants. And we were supposed to be enhancing our cards, which if you play Gloomhaven, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We were not doing that. At that point, what do you do? It's like Monopoly. It'd be like Monopoly if you, okay, let's put it this way. It's like Monopoly. You go past go, you don't collect your 200 bucks. And at the same time, you land on someone's hotel continually and never pay them. Like you're not really following the rules and you probably would have lost a long time before you, you know what I mean, before you noticed that. So 
we made the decision to start over. And it just dawned on me that, you know, do I approach my knitting that way? Do I look at those errors and start over? And what I decided for me and my projects is if I look down and I see it, and now every time that's all I think about when I see it, then I'm probably going to have to fix it. But if I look down and, and go, oh, that's where I learned how to. And I have so many projects where I didn't know what I was doing and I finally got the hang of it. And you can see the transition in my work. I'm okay with that. I'm not selling my knit goods to people. These aren't gifts. This, these are things that are just mine at the house. If it's a gift, that's probably a different conversation. But when they're, these are things for you. I like looking at the transition of seeing, okay, that's where I started to try to learn brioche. And look how good I got by the end. Well, good. <laughs> Good's probably giving me a little benefit of the doubt there, but you know what I'm saying? So I like to be able to see that. It doesn't really bother me. And quite frankly, if I were to wear something out of the house that had, you know, something like that transition in it or had mistakes in it, and someone was close enough to notice and close and they said something, they had better be a knitter, number one. But, but then that's a cool conversation to have, right? So, yeah, I don't think, because I argued with Steve about starting Gloomhaven over. But we did it, and I'm glad we did because I'm playing a different character. That It doesn't matter. So it's like, do you start Monopoly over or not? I don't know. Leave it in the comments. Like, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about owning mistakes? Do you go backwards and make them perfect? Or do you own them and move forward? And neither is wrong, guys. Like, I, I'm not placing judgment on either one. It may sound like I am, but I'm not. I think both are fine. But I think it's interesting that mentality of like, I need to redo this correctly versus I've learned from it and I'm going to move forward. You, you end up at the same place, right? It's just a different method of getting there. Leave in the comments how you guys handle that. I'm, I really want to know because it just, it really did fascinate me. So anyway, we restarted Gloomhaven. We're only two scenarios in. That's my gaming news. And yeah, that's what I got for you. Um, I know this podcast is probably dropping a couple days late because life was crazy. You guys don't care. I hope you just are having a good time. I hope you're cuddled up. I know that a lot of people are getting just blasted with snow. So cuddle your fur babies, you know. Okay, and can we take a, <laughs> can we take a moment to look at this? Lebo's took us. <laughs> so cute. Okay, so that's it. Love yourself so you can love one another. Take care of yourself so you can take care of one another. Be gentle with me at my midlife crisis. <laughs> and yeah, I'll see you in a couple weeks. Enjoy the footage of Sprite that will be coming up. It's short and sweet because I don't have a lot of photos of her, but she was just a fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy ball of love. I'll see you guys later. Hey guys, this is the story of Sprite. Sprite was cute as a button when she came into the shelter. She was a big fuzzball, but she had horrible poops and even worse teeth. We knew we needed to get her diet on track, so we brought her home. Um, and that took, I'm going to tell you, the better part of a year to get her digestive system on track. But we also had to take her to the vet every eight weeks, basically, to have her teeth filed and floated because she couldn't grind her own teeth. And one of her teeth were at, was actually fractured. So PSA, take your brother to the vet. Have their teeth checked. Other PSA is always know where your rabbit is because this little bunny liked to hide. Look how cute she is. That's her Marilyn Monroe on a heating vent. But anyway, she would hide and I would come home and I would try to find her and it would take forever and she thought it was super funny. And one day I came home and I really couldn't find her and I looked everywhere. She wasn't asleep in the living room. She wasn't just sitting looking cute like she normally did. I literally just couldn't find her. And finally, after about 15, 20 minutes, I found her in a trash can, happy as a lark. And that's the story of Sprite. And I loved her. <laughs>